heard every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, it's uh, interesting, and um, 30 years of ministry, I've never had a chalk artist in the last three weeks. Now I've got two. <laughs> and we might just do this every three weeks or something. Who knows from here on out. But it's, it's God's providence uh, that those things happen. And, uh, and so the Reinards came last year, and uh, we're at our tent. And I was actually out of town last year, so I missed it, but I heard great things. And uh, then we were able to have them come back this year, and, and I was able to catch parts of it. I was never able to catch the whole thing because of my other obligations this week. Uh, but I, what I saw, I liked, and it was certainly a joy to see our church tent filled with people here in the gospel. Uh, that was a great thing. And so uh, we wanted them to come tonight and be a part of uh, our service this evening. And uh, the Reinards are good people. They're friends of the Furkles. Uh, and so... Uh, we appreciate that, and uh, they're going to take over the service. She's going to preach while he draws, <laughs> or <laughs> uh, he'll, he'll share a gospel message with you, or some type of a message, a Bible message, I'll put it that way, with you tonight, while she's going to draw, and uh, I trust and I know that this will be a blessing to you, and keep in mind that we will receive a love offering for them after the service. So, Brother Reinhard, I'm going to just turn it over to you at this point, brother. You're welcome. Appreciate being here. Uh, I tell you what, with these little ladies singing and the chalk artists, <clears throat> I think we can take this thing on the road, you know. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know if they'll need to preach or not, but that was good singing. That blessed my soul. So how is everybody this evening? 
Good, good, fine, all that. You know, uh, my dad had something he used to say, and uh, I've I've memorized it, and I I built it out every now and then. And uh, we were um, over at the Winnebago County Fair west of Chicago, Illinois, uh, about 10 days ago. And um, they have a a bathroom attendant in the men's room. And he keeps things, you know, nice and clean in order. And he likes his tip, you know, when you go in and out. So that's all right and everything. So I've been working on him the last couple years. His name's Mark. He's... I guess he's this close to being saved, you know, and uh, so y'all pray for Mark, the bathroom attendant, but I walked in there one day shortly after one of our giveaways, I just got done preaching, Lord had me all fired up, and he said, how you doing, preacher? I said, too blessed to be stressed, too enlightened to be frightened, my past is redeemed, my presence makes sense, and my future is secure, <laughs> and somebody over in the stall said, can you write that down? <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I started with that. <laughs> Oh my, so yes, Chalk Full of Grace, Um, that's the name of our ministry, and we are called to be missionaries to the United States of America. How many of you all think we need more gospel in America? Amen. So boy, we got to reach some people out at the fair. Um, You might have heard all about it this morning, so I'm not going to redo all that, but we gave away about 700 of your tracts with numbers on them as tickets, and um, there were several, several people that heard the gospel. We had some hands raised, Uh, praise the Lord for that. So how many of you all know where you were May 20th, 1985? How many of you all were on the planet then? Come on. All right. Well, I know exactly where I was. Nobody could ever raise their hand to that unless it was their anniversary or the day they proposed, right? And uh, so (laughs) my dad and I were traveling down the road in a 1979 Ford Esquire station wagon. Had the fake wood siding on the side, peeling off, you know, had about 300,000 miles. How many of y'all had one? It's confession time. All right, some of the younger folks say, what is a station wagon? <laughs> right? <laughs> well, you look out back in some of the cornfields, you might see one somewhere <laughs> at this point. And uh, we were getting off the off-ramp there, Interstate I-81 there, Winchester, Virginia, and looked down over, and there's a yard down there that was having a yard sale. And my dad loved yard sales. I just thought they were the biggest waste of time ever, you know. And I'm driving, I'm trying to ignore it, and he's looking back and looking back. This guy's neck broken. I said, I guess you want to go to that yard sale. He said, you know I do. I said, I turned on the right blinker, and we <clears throat> turned right, turned right again real quick, got to 185 Red Bud Road, where the yard sale was. Got out, and he started looking around. And I started looking around. And underneath an oak tree across the yard was sitting... Rebecca Adams. Minding her own business. <clears throat> now, I don't recommend ladies giving your phone number to a total stranger. This was before we were saved, okay? But <clears throat> she couldn't help herself, okay? <laughs> you know, they say Virginia is for lovers, and, you know, it was first sight for her. But um, I walked over and I said, You sure have a pretty smile, and I left with a phone number. My dad left with a toolbox. I found my wife at a yard sale. (laughs) May 20th, 1985. That's the truth. And she's going to draw for you. Come on up here, honey. And uh, that's right. That's right. Uh, You pray for us. We we are uh, going into full time missionary work. Missionary evangelist uh, is what I am. What we're doing. And. we have been doing these uh, chalk talks for nine years already. Been in 60 different churches. Uh, the last five years, God has really poured it on. Um, we've just, uh, it's, it's hard. We have a carpet cleaning business back in Winchester, okay? And it's hard for us to stay there and clean carpets and, and be on the road as much as the Lord would like us to. So we're in that hard spot right now. But we're on deputation. Uh, you know, we're looking, uh, looking to go full time as soon as we can. And uh, so you all pray about that, and uh, we really, really appreciate that. Um, So I am going to do something a little strange. Oh, can we get these lights down up front because there's a shadow coming down? Did you turn your light on? Okay, good. And at the very end, we want to kill all the lights, but I'll let you know when to do that. So how many of you all could say that you've had a major storm in your life at some time or another? Yeah, usually we get a lot of hands for that. And if you're, if you're pretty young, uh, God bless you, you haven't had one yet, but chances are you're going to sooner or later. So I hope this message this evening blesses you. It's a, it's a little, um, 
different what I'm going to be doing. I'm actually going to disappear and be behind you. And uh, that way we give the artist the stage. Give her a moment to get a little head start on me here. We will be giving away that drawing there to the left of her um, afterwards. I'm not sure the ticket system you have in place. I guess there's one. And um, somebody's going to take away a drawing for free, just a lot like she was doing out at the fair. You know, when I was a child, I was fascinated by storms. I just loved them. I, I, Rainstorm, snowstorm, windy conditions, it, it didn't matter. I, I'd just be out in them. My, my mom, she tells stories about how I'd find a piece of plastic and I'd get some lawn chairs together and uh, I'd, I'd stack them up and I'd put that plastic over top and I'd just sit under there out in the rainstorm and, and just watch the water come down. It, it was just something that fascinated me. Sometimes I just put my boots on and go out and play in the rain, lay down in the, in the gutter and, and actually uh, just let the water rush over me. So y'all pray for me. I don't do that anymore, but that was something in my childhood. You know, one time I made a sail cart. I knew, I knew that it was really windy and I heard it was going to get a whole lot windier. And I, I found an old go-kart frame and had some wheels on it didn't have a motor and I rigged up this sail and I put it on there and and uh, boy I tell you when the wind caught a hold of that thing it took me faster and further than I wanted to go and I didn't know anything about brakes then and boy did I did I pay <laughs> as a child it seemed that storms came out of nowhere and I suppose some of them did escape the forecasters in those days and I'm not nearly as inclined to go out in the storms like that now unless maybe it's hunting season. Then I'll still go out in just about anything. That's a whole different category right there. And speaking of category, back in 2017, the United States, the mainland, had an unprecedented number of Category 4 storms hit, hurricanes. Two of them, uh, names were Harvey, and one, that was in Texas, and Irma over there in Florida took several lives, caused billions and billions of dollars in damage. And there were some others that hit the mainland that year also, but over there in Puerto Rico, they had Maria. And I don't, don't think they've uh, recovered from that yet. All of these storms, these hurricanes, they were forecasted in advance. And many people evacuated out of the path of these killer storms. And some of them couldn't, and some just wouldn't. You know, the power and the calamity and the violence and the distress of a major storm is something we'd all just assume avoid, wouldn't we? And then again, perhaps not everyone. Have you ever heard of the hurricane party? Back in 1969, in a little town in Mississippi along the coast, a group of people were preparing to have a hurricane party. That party was in the face of a storm, a killer hurricane named Camille. Some people to this day even remember that name. One of the churches we were at recently, he was there. The wind was howling outside the posh Richelieu apartments when the police chief, his name was Jerry, he pulled up sometime after dark. And there, facing the beach, less than 50 yards from the surf, that apartment building was directly in the line of danger. That's where Camille was supposed to make landfall. A man with a drink, a drink in his hand, he came out on a second floor balcony and he waved at Jerry, the police officer. As the police officer yelled up at him, he said, y'all need to clear out of here as quickly as you can. The storm's getting worse. Well, it wasn't long before others joined him on the balcony and they all had their drinks and they were all laughing at Jerry the police officer he was ordering them to leave one of the people yelled down well this is my land you're going to have to arrest me if you want me to leave 
Well, Jerry didn't arrest anyone, and he wasn't able to persuade anybody to leave either. What he did do was write down the name of the next of kin of the 20 or so people who gathered there at the hurricane party at the Richelieu Apartments. They laughed as he took down their names. They'd all been warned, but they had no intention of leaving. It was 10.15 p.m. when the front wall of the storm came ashore. Scientists clocked Camille's wind speed at more than 205 miles per hour. The strongest on record up to that point, maybe even to this day. Raindrops hit with the force of bullets and waves off the Gulf Coast crested up to 28 feet high. News reports later show that the worst damage came to that little settlement along the shore there in Mississippi of motels and bars and gambling casinos where some 20 people were killed at a hurricane party at the Richelieu Apartments. Nothing was left of that three-story structure but the foundation. And the only survivor was a five-year-old boy found clinging to a mattress the following day. Let me ask you this. If there was somebody you knew, or, or maybe even a stranger that was in the path of destruction, would you warn them? If the forecast information shared with them would change the course of their life to a place of safety, would you share it with them? What about life storms? Life storms often take us by surprise, can't be avoided. You know, what we can do, though, is determine the way we react to them. Oftentimes, we find ourselves stuck within a storm of life when we could be moving out of it or away from its grasp. God, who created us, put within us the ability to grieve and to grow. And most of all, to lean on Him and take His hand and let Him lead us out of a dark place. One of the first Bible verses I memorized when I became a Christian about 20 years ago. Be careful for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests made known unto the Lord. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Staying in the path of a storm can destroy you. Staying in a storm of life can destroy you can weaken you, confuse you. Remember this, who the Son sets free is free indeed. There's a storm approaching mankind. Oh, this evening I'm not talking to a, about a hurricane or a, or a tornado or a major snow event. I'm warning of the storm of the judgment of sin. Some here are already in a place of safety. Some perhaps are not. I plead with you. Listen closely. Heed the forecast and take refuge in the only place of safety, the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't make light of the warning. Don't make light of the impending judgment. But yet some folks do. You know, I ask myself sometimes why I do things that I ought not. Even though I'm saved and the Lord's working on me in some areas, and I'm sure He's working on you. None of us have arrived yet, right? The Bible says, the thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there's no new thing under the sun. It's the same today as yesterday and yesteryears as it was in Noah's day. The Lord Jesus Christ talked about Noah's day. The storm of judgment by the floodwaters then is like the storm of judgment day soon for sins now. But I'm here to tell you there's a way out. For 120 years, God through Noah gave warning of an approaching storm, a vast storm, a storm so huge that water would completely cover the face of the earth. That was the forecast. Noah preached the forecast. The power, the calamity, the violence and distress of that storm was clearly forecasted by God Himself through the preaching of Noah. Genesis 6, 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Why? 
Well, the word goes on to say, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I believe we're living in the days of Noah. God was lamenting then. He grieved and he groaned and he expressed sorrow for what the people had done to themselves. And there's nothing new under the sun. Mankind was that way then and mankind is that way still. But all was not lost then. And all is not lost now. God waited in the days of Noah. Put your name there. I'm going to put mine out loud. God waited in the days of Greg. Aren't you glad God waited on you? God waited in the day of Noah while the ark was a preparing. There was an ark of safety offered then, and folks, there's an ark of safety offered now. Grace offered then, and grace offered now. In your Bibles in Genesis uh, chapter 6, verse 8, it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. One of the things I tried to impress upon the people at the preaching sessions we had at the tent at the fair was the grace of God and not of works is how you're saved. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Didn't say he deserved it, said he found it. Genesis 7, 1 says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteousness before me in this generation. I want to preach a message to you this evening, a message entitled, The Other Side of the Storm. Now, modern forecasting has come a long way, or has it? Sure, we can know about hurricanes approaching the mainland sometimes 10, 15 days out with good accuracy of where they're going to land. That's impressive. God gave people a forecast for 120 years, the flood of the earth. That's amazing. And Noah preached the forecast. Now, a lot of us, us preachers sometimes will preach about what causes life storms. I'm not going to do that this evening. And sometimes us preachers will preach about what we should do during a storm of life. Pray to God, get a hold of God, and seek God's guidance. Certainly what you should do. I'm not going to spend any time on what we should do in a storm of life. What I am going to preach on, spend some time on here this evening is... <laughs> the other side of the storm. I'm glad there's the other side of life storms, aren't you? Noah went through the storm, and he came out on the other side. There's a storm of addiction sweeping this land. We were over at Harvest Baptist Temple and did their Friday night Reformers Unanimous program. We have a, the same program at our church in Winchester, Virginia. The storm of addiction is a plague upon this land but you can be delivered to the other side. You know when the ark came through to the other side of the storm, it didn't come to rest in a valley low or in an arid desert, no, or on a stormy beach, no. The ark came to rest high on Mount Ararat. And this might just be me, but I believe when Noah and his family walked out of that boat, they were walking higher than they'd ever walked before. And you will too, if you let him bring you through the storm. Aren't you glad the Bible says, and it shall come to pass? I'm glad valleys are not forever. I'm glad affliction and addiction is not forever. I'm glad storms are not forever. There's always the other side of the storm. Before Noah's flood, before that storm came into Noah's life, we read in Genesis 6, 8 that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And may I say this evening, ladies and gentlemen, that God's grace will see you through the storm. I'm glad Noah had God before the storm and in the midst of the storm and certainly on the other side of the storm. We need to place our lives in God's hands before, in the midst, and on the other side of life storms. <clears throat> because I tell you, grace is real. And you can find grace to be real before, in the midst, and on the other side of the storm. Oh, we look for grace a lot of times other places. We ought not. We know where to look. But sometimes it's the world we turn to. Sometimes it's even religion. Brethren, sometimes. I'm glad here this evening that grace can be found in the eyes of the Lord. You know what grace is? Sure we do. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Unmerited favor. God's riches at Christ's expense. For by grace are you saved through faith. Grace is an important word in the Bible. 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, if you've done any kind of soul winning or Bible sharing or Bible study, that's a very familiar verse. And sometimes we can just get so familiar with the things that, that we know and share that it's kind of just wrote to us sometimes. Folks, I remember when that verse had its effect on me as a lost man. Grace, unmerited favor. Have you found grace in the eyes of the Lord? Have you trusted in God's free gift of Jesus Christ? Or are you trusting in yourself and your own works? Instead of Christ's finished work, His finished perfect work, His shed blood on your behalf on the cross. Noah trusted in God's provision. And God brought Noah to the other side of the storm. I just love the word grace. Amazing grace, sovereign grace, holy grace. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And folks, it was sufficient to bring him through the storm. Real quick tonight, I believe Grace taught Noah three things, at least three things. only got three for you tonight. It taught him that God did not forsake him in the midst of the storm. Number one, God did not forsake him in the midst of the storm. God didn't run out on Noah. God didn't jump ship. In fact, God was with Noah before the storm even happened. I mean before one clap of thunder, before one streak of lightning, before the fountains of the deep opened up and it rained for the first time, God was already with Noah. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, don't forget that God told Noah some things. He told him how wide, how long, and how tall to build the ark. And after a time of extended grace came the first great invitation in the Bible. You did know our God as an inviting God, didn't you? God in that first great invitation didn't tell Noah, go into the ark. He said, come, <laughs> thou into the ark. Just messing around with you a little bit there. God was already with Noah before the storm because God said to Noah, come thou into the ark. And Noah and his family did one of the most amazing things. They went in. <laughs> You know, after I got saved, one of the first things I got to thinking about after I settled down some was why did I wait so long? Come thou into the ark. And knowing his family obeyed God. They accepted his great invitation, and when they were all safely inside, and after a short period of time, God shut the door. The flood couldn't get to Noah, and Noah couldn't get to the flood. He was safe on the inside, sealed up on the inside. Oh, dear folks, you've got to be on the inside. The ark is a picture of Christ. It's what we call an Old Testament type of Christ. And God sealing up the door is a picture of eternal security in your salvation in Christ. I think of verses like being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Are you nigh to God this evening? Are you near? The question is, are you in the ark of Christ Jesus today? Have you accepted the greatest invitation of all times to have your sins forgiven, have a guaranteed home in heaven waiting for you in the presence of Almighty God forever? Are you on the inside? Or are you on the outside? You know, God shut the door behind Noah and sealed him in to the other side. And God is soon to shut the door on this age of grace. And take those in Christ, both live and dead, to the other side. I suggest you don't miss the boat. You know, both doors being shut resulted in saved souls and lost souls. People that lived and people that perished. What have you done concerning God's Son, the ever-living ark of safety? What have you done with the greatest invitation ever made? Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Well, perhaps you're sitting there thinking, well, I'll make it my own way. I'll hold on for all I'm worth. I'll do the best that I can, and maybe, just maybe, I'll make it. 
I'm here to tell you kindly, with all my heart, that that boat won't float. You're not going to be able to do it. You know, I've read over and over and over again the account of what God told Noah about how to build that ark, and I've noticed over and over and over again one thing. Nowhere did God tell Noah to put handles on the outside of that boat for those who declined his invitation of grace to hold on to and to do their best with to save their souls from drowning to death. God knew their best wasn't good enough. Their best wasn't going to last 40 days and 40 nights. God knew anyone's ability to hold on to the other side was futile. They would perish outside the ark. Doing your best, holding on to your best ability, trusting in yourself is not going to be good enough for the salvation of your soul. My Bible says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Do you know what mercy is? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. <laughs> Both are summed up in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, separation from God forever. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace taught Noah three things. Noah was shut up with God in the ark, and God did not forsake Noah in that storm. And can I say grace taught Noah something else? God did not fail Noah in the midst of the storm. You say, do you reckon that boat floated? I say, yep, it floated just fine. You say, well, how do you know? Well, when you build anything the way God says to, out of what God says to, your boat will float. Just as simple as that. God told Noah what to do, how to do it. And he told Noah this, pitch it on the inside and on the outside with pitch. Pitch is the same Hebrew word, <laughs> atonement. Pitch is the same Hebrew word, atonement. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms thou shalt make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Same Hebrew word, atonement, which means to cleanse, to disannul, to forgive, be merciful, to pardon, purge away, and reconcile. God said, pitch it. We're going to make it judgment-proof. We're going to make it leak-proof. We're going to atone it from within and from without. Now remember, the ark is a type of Christ. And, and uh, you know why you can't go to hell if you're in Christ? Because you've been pitched in. Just as simple as that. This man from Virginia will tell you, you've been pitched in <laughs> if you know Christ as your Savior. Oh, folks, you've got to be on the inside. There's no strength in of yourselves to get the job done. And hold on for all your worth on the outside. There are no handles on the ark and no handles on Jesus Christ. My Bible says He's the one that keeps me. God says, come on in and I'll seal you for eternity with me. And not with the devil, but the forecast has been given. The time is running out. And the door is soon to be closed in this age of grace. I wonder when that storm bared down on that Richelieu apartment building, how many people wished they weren't there before they got wiped out. You know, Genesis 6.3 says, And the Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man. You know, after a while, God's just plain old had enough. In Noah's time, time ran out, and a floodwater swept across the earth. Your time is also running out. Staying in the path of the storm of the judgment of your sin is not wise. You've got to evacuate. You've got to be on the inside. Pitch is the same Hebrew word atonement. The Bible says that Christ's blood was an atonement for our sin. I'm saved. If you're saved, say amen. amen. Yeah. We're on the other side of the blood, aren't we? We're pitched in and God has sealed the door. The devil, he was defeated by the shed blood of Calvary. In order for him to get to me or any of you that are saved, he'd have to go through the blood, the atonement, the pitch. Those flood waters were never going to get to Noah, and the devil can never get to my soul or yours if you're saved. He'd have to go through the blood, and that's never, ever going to happen. 
I just simply took God up on his invitation. Just like Noah's family, God said, come on in. I said, I believe I'll do that. January 19th of 2000, I went on in. I just stand on the word of God that says, verily, verily, this is Jesus. He said, I say unto you, put your name there. He that heareth my word and believeth on him, him that sent me hath everlasting life, shall never come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Is passed beyond the storm of judgment day, and has already been, as it were, safely delivered to the other side. The Apostle Paul says that we were already seated in the heavenlies. You know, none of those animals died on that trip. No of the others didn't either. God did not fail them. Everything they needed to get from one shore to the other was on the inside of that ark. They were sealed off from the outside circumstances. And God orchestrated the design of that ark that if they wanted to see out, they'd have to look up to that one and only light, that window at the top of the ark. And God still wants His people to take that upward look. Grace taught Noah three things. God did not forsake Noah, and God did not fail Noah. And may I say, God has not failed you, and God has not forsaken you. Aren't you glad in 2019 He's still alive and on His throne? Grace taught Noah one other thing, that God didn't forget him. Didn't forsake him, didn't fail him, and didn't forget him. God knew right where he was. It wasn't like five days into this thing that God looked around and said, Where's Noah? No, 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 no. You see, the ark had GPS. God positioning system. God didn't forget about him. The lightning flashed, the thunder rolled. I mean, the waves beat against that boat. There was turmoil and trouble and trials on the outside. But on the inside, there was a table spread. And I'm telling you, if you're in the ark of safety, you've got a table spread. And there's turmoil and trouble and trials on the outside in your life. You've got a table spread. You've got everything you need to get to the other side of the storm, in Christ. Inside there was a pilot that was never going to let them go down. Was never going to leave them. Folks, who's your pilot today? Is it like that bumper sticker we used to see sometimes? It wasn't right. It said, God is my co-pilot. That was bad. <laughs> God needs to be your pilot. You need to switch seats. Let him at the controls. Towards the end of their ordeal and the end of this message, we read this. And God remembered Noah. I remember when God waited on Greg, and I remember when God remembers me. I'm glad that God has not forgotten about you. You say, well, I feel like God has. I hadn't heard from Him in a while. Been through a tough patch in my life, some affliction, some storms, and, well, I just don't know where God is. Well, maybe you don't, but I guarantee you this, God knows right where you are. You just go to Him. He's never let one of His own down. He's never let one of His own perish. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? <laughs> He's never had to come up with plan B. Folks, He is the plan. He knows the way through the wilderness. He never forgot no, and He's never forgotten you. And aren't you glad storms don't last? Aren't you glad there's always the other side of the storm? In Genesis 8, 11, we read this, And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off of the earth. Three things quickly that Noah found. Not before, not during, but on the other side of the storm. Number one, he saw the dove. And you know that when that dove got to flying around that ark with that olive leaf, what that meant to Noah? It meant that there was sweet peace on the other side of the storm. Sweet peace on the other side of the storm. Another thing that Noah saw on the other side of the storm, we find in chapter 8, verse 20, and Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Noah saw a dove of sweet peace and Noah saw an altar of sacrificial praise. He built it. Now, in studying the Bible, we have what's called the law of first mention. When you read something for the first time in the Bible, it's big. And look out, because there are certain characteristics about it. It's going to be present each and every time after that first mention. And in our King James Bible, there's 321 verses. 
that have the word altar in them. Genesis 8.20 is the first mention. And it happened right outside the door of the ark on the other side of the storm. Listen up. They had just gone through the worst ordeal of their lives, an awful experience. But when they got on the other side of the storm, the first thing Noah said was, boys, it's altar building time. That word altar means to exalt, to lift high, to elevate. That's what the altar did. You didn't just throw a clean sacrifice on the dirty ground because the ground had the curse of God on it. You put the sacrifice on the altar, and the altar pointed the sacrifice to the God who was worthy of the sacrifice. And on the other side of the storm, they said, it's worship time, it's praise time, it's altar building time. I don't believe they came out griping and complaining. No, they said this, I believe. It's time to give God praise and glory because he saw us through the storm. You see, that dove said sweet peace. And that altar said sacrificial praise. Sometimes it is sacrificial praise on our behalf, isn't it? We don't just praise God when something good happens. Job lost it all and praised God anyway. Think of Jonah in the belly of that whale. He wants out bad, wouldn't you? <laughs> He prays. He's still in the belly of the whale. He confesses and repents. He's still in the belly of the whale. And about that time, if you read, he said, well, not exact quote, but it's all right. I offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving for where I'm at. And that fish, that whale, couldn't take it anymore. And he spits old Jonah up on the dry ground. Sacrificial praise. Aren't you glad it's not... Up to the devil how we react. Sometimes we might see something on TV how we might react. Dr. Phil, he doesn't know anything. Aren't you glad that we can take it to the Lord? Thank God there's praise on the other side of the storm. You know what the world needs to see today? More Christians who are excited and thankful about serving a God who's real and and holy and good. Folks, we're behind on our praise. I'm talking about out there, not in here. And lastly, there's one more thing, and we know what it is. We'll get the lights down in the house. Rebecca, you'll get that light ready. One more thing that Noah saw on the other side of the storm. To get the lights off on the screens up there too if we can. Noah saw the dove of sweet peace. The altar of sacrificial praise. And God said in Genesis 9.13, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. A token. It shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. You know, it takes... Two things to make a rainbow. A massive disturbance in the upper atmosphere. I had a raise of hands before I got started. The people that had a massive disturbance in their life at some time or another. You know, it takes two things to make that rainbow. A massive disturbance in the upper atmosphere. After the massive disturbance, it takes sunshine. Here's the mystery of the rainbow. After the massive disturbance, we know there's all those water droplets in the atmosphere. And after that massive disturbance, the sun shines bright on the other side of the storm. And those rays shine back through the disturbance. And those droplets, I call them tears, act like a prism. And God's seven natural colors fill the sky. Here's the formula. No storm, no sunshine, no rainbow. That's life's formula. Google says that rainbows are best seen when the sun is at a 40 degree angle above the horizon. God's people wandered in the wilderness 40 years. Noah's flood was the result of 40 days and 40 nights of rain. Jesus fasted in the wilderness 40 days and nights. Just some interesting numbers. Have you ever seen a double rainbow? They're not real rare. More rare are a triple rainbow. But did you know that all rainbows are a full circle? Yep. Nobody's ever seen one here on earth. You can't because the horizon blocks half the view. 
But I know of a man who saw one. He had to leave earth to see it, but he did that long before man could take flight. I even know his name. His name was John. And he wrote in the Bible about that in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 3. And this is what John said. And he that sat, talking about Jesus on his throne, he that sat was to look upon like as a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, full circle, and sight like unto an emerald. That rainbow, God said, was a token. That word token appears in some amazing places in the Bible. Token means proof of purchase. In Exodus, the night of the Passover, the blood on the door was a token. And the blood shall be for you a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. (laughs) The death angel couldn't touch anyone who was inside a house that had the blood of a lamb applied to the lintel of the door of the house they were in. And my question in closing here this evening is this. Has the blood of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus, been applied to where you are spiritually? On the lintel of of your heart's door, Are you in the ark of safety? Don't stay on the outside. Don't stay in the destructive path of the payment for your sin. You know, like my sail cart as a child, sin will take you further than you want to go, make you stay longer than you want to stay, and make you pay more than you want to pay. Folks, the storm of judgment by the floodwaters then is like the storm of judgment day soon for your sins now. But next time it's going to be by fire. Are you safe inside the ark of Christ? Are you justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus? We can have the lights back up in the house. Go ahead and turn up the lights if you want. We serve an amazing God, don't we? Gives people talents. They give them back to Him for His glory. You know, each and every one of you has something God's given you that you can do for Him. Might not be this, but you, God will let you know what it is. So are you safe on the inside? If you are, let me know. Amen? Amen. Let's all bow our heads. Lord God, thank you so much for this evening. Lord, your word goes out. doesn't return void. I just wonder if there's anybody in the house, in the church here this evening, that they're concerned that they're not on the inside. They don't know. If you don't know for sure, you've got a place in heaven waiting on you. You can get that settled. God says, come on in. I'll seal you to the other side. You can spend eternity with me. Anybody in the house, in the, in the church tonight like that, would you just raise your hand up? I'm not going to come to you. Anybody, I just want to pray for you. Anybody? It needs to be saved tonight. Okay, amen. I see that hand. Anybody else? Okay, Lord, I'm going to close now. God, I just pray that that hand that was raised, Lord, that, that that person would go and talk to somebody, Lord, that can help them. Lord, it's a, it's a special situation, a special need. You that raised your hand, you need to go talk to an adult. Have them explain to you how to be saved. You can be safe on the inside, little one. You can have your sins forgiven and know for sure you've got a place in heaven waiting for you when you die. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Pastor?
that have the documents to get special stuff. You have to be 